Guys, guys, it's time to talk about my boys. What is up, you guys? It's me, your girl, your Casey. How are you doing? 2020 is finished. Finito. Done. Bye bye. Logged in the annals of his annals. Is that the word? Logged in the annals of history. Let's let's pretend I'm right. I might be right. Annals. I have already posted my favorite and worst books of 2020. But now it's time to get to those leading lads, the hunky heroes, those beautiful boys. It is my favorite and the worst male characters of 2020. Shout out to last year's winner, Kaz Brecker from Six of Crows, Crooked Kingdom for being an absolute snack. Yum yum. And you guys should know the drill right now, unless you're new, then how to do. We're gonna start with the fifth worst, then we're gonna do the fifth best, fourth worst, fourth best, and we're gonna make our way up till we get to the king and the royal fool, the best and the worst of 2020. And so starting off with the pretty bad honor, but relatively better honor of being the least worst on this list is our fifth worst character of 2020. And that is Mr. Howie from the I Hunt Killers trilogy. Me and this book series have a past. I loved the start of it. The second book was Meh-ish. And the third book, while it was beautiful in most parts, was very disgusting in other parts, which really bumped down my rating. But that first book, man, that was almost a five star. But the one consecutive thing in this book series that always bucked it down was our main character's best friend, Howie. I Hunt Killers is a series about our boy Jasper. We call him Jazz. Now Jazz, he's your typical guy, maybe on the outside, but really, He's the son of the most nefarious, evilest, worst serial killer out there. Like, Billy Dent, his daddy, is an awful person. Rapist. Racist. Rapscallion. Something else with an R. But that man was sure fun to read. He was evil and I loved him for that. He was entertaining to read. However, our boy Jazz, like, daddy's locked in prison now. And Jazz, he's like, oh, I've been trained my whole life to be a serial killer. I can't withhold these impulses. So he's out in the real world trying to not, you know, kill people. And you would think he's doing good by now. He has a girlfriend. He's going to school, he's taking care of his grandma, but he's also charged with solving another serial killer mystery happening at his own doorstep in his own town. And he might need dear old dad's help to solve this mystery. Now Jazz as a character was awesome. I love Jazz. I loved all the thoughts going through his mind. He was intelligent and also really inwardly broody and I love that in a man. A fictional man. I don't know if I can deal with that in real life. Just no more brood. Stop rooting. But we were always pulled away from the awesome Jasper scenes to be in his friend Howie's point of view for some weird reason. Howie is the blandest, entirely ineffective comic relief. Like he isn't funny and he's trying to be. And what he's doing throughout this whole series that he's forcibly in is he's taking away screen time from Jasper and Billy Dent, which is what I want. He was annoying. He was given, sadly, a much bigger role in the second and third book. Because in the second book, Jasper is in a whole new city. Howie's back home. And now he's part of a mystery too, and he has to solve things, which takes more time away from Jasper. And he literally had no personality besides he wants a chick, he thinks he's funny, and he's a uh, hypo... Can't remember the medical term, but if he gets a cut, he has a medical condition, if he gets a cut, he will bleed to death, even if it's the smallest cut. Hypochondriac? I don't know. Hemochondriac. I ain't no doctor. This character honestly should not have existed in the first place. This book series should have had just one point of view. The existence of Howie and any other weird side characters that just insist on having their own screen time. It's one of the reasons this series really went on a downhill path. The I Hunt Killers trilogy had so much potential, but it ultimately let me down. So I went from loving it to being eh about it. Main thing to take away from this. If you have multiple point of views in your book, one of them is like the designated comic relief wiseacre character. He needs to be funny and poignant. Okay, and speaking of the same trilogy, my fifth best character is Jazz from the I Hunt Killers trilogy. I mean, I basically already told you guys 
what I liked about him, his internal broodiness, and he's also like a Sherlock Holmes, but he also has like incentive to kill sometimes too. So that was great, and I love that. But I also have a tie for the fifth best male character of 2020, and that would be my boy Warner from the Shatter Me series. Show it, show it. I'm sexy and I know it. Okay, Shatter Me would not be nearly as popular without the existence of this character. This man, Baby Got Back, because his back must be hurting because he is carrying this whole series on those backs. Shatter Me focuses on our girl Juliet, who has been locked away in a dark, dingy cell because she is a threat to humanity. She is the sweetest, scaredest, kindest girl, but she has the gift or the curse of lethal touch. If she touches you, you're going to be in extreme pain for a couple seconds, then you're just going to flop on the floor and die, expire, breathe your last. But then our boy Warner, who is the son of this super high up general in this dystopian government, he's like, what the hell is this? We have a secret weapon in our midst. I can use her ability for my own agendas. Mm. So he sends one of his men into Juliet's cell as like a false prisoner. Just like lay the groundwork, see if she's like unstable or anything like that, build up a connection. Then Warner swoops in through the asylum, kidnaps both Juliet and his guy that he snuck into the asylum, takes them out. Then Juliet wakes up on the floor and Warner's like, hello there. You're mine now. He has this deeply troubling backstory. Motives no one but him can comprehend. He has the ire of the very girl he rescued. And he hates Adam, which is a big plus in my opinion. Seeing him as a villain was pretty amazing because he is smart and he knows what he's doing. But the short story we had of him right after the first book was one of the best short stories in a series I've ever read. Like he's the villain, yes, but you have to love him. You hear that? that lawnmower again. And ultimately you go from hating this guy's guts to rooting for him in the very end. Also, Warner may have taken his shirt off a few times. I might have enjoyed that. Yes! <laughs> okay, the fourth worst character we have from 2020 is Grayson from the Scythe Trilogy. You know, I kind of liked him from the start. He came in in the second book, Thunderhead. And in this world, there is a giant AI, basically it replaced the internet, is called the Thunderhead. It's in charge of basically the whole world. But it's not like one of those A, those, it's not one of those typical AIs that like took over the world. It really cares about humanity. But in Thunderhead, after the events of the first book, Scythe, where you have the government operating over here and the whole operations of the Scythe, the people who go out and kill the basically immortal human race now to keep the population down, there's a bit of unbalancing there because the Scythe is supposed to have no nothing to do with government, but it's becoming a little government of itself. So the Thunderhead is like taking note of this. It's not allowed to interfere with the Scythe's work at all because he's a robot. The Thunderhead's a robot basically. And you know, humans are humans. Let the humans deal with how they're going to keep the population down themselves. But he also, he's like, mm, I got to interfere with this. <laughs> so he appoints this nobody Grayson to do his dirty work for him. Now Grayson at the start was a very, not goofy but just he was likable and just kind of like nonplussed about everything like he was flustered easily like he was the most normal guy shoved into this weird situation where he lost his job his standing all because the thunderhead made that happen so the thunderhead could use him but once grayson figured out what was happening he was like oh, oh okay sure whatever you say mr ai thunderhead guy so grayson like goes undercover and i this, I honestly don't think the author knew how to write Grayson's character because either he was really method actoring his various roles as the Thunder Guy, Thunder Guys, the Thunderhead's eyes and ears because it was like every single chapter he was a brand new person. His 
personality was just all over the place, especially in the start of the third book. I actually DNF'd the toll and he was a big reason why. Like, I don't think it was a character arc at all because he's definitely not the same person he was at the beginning of Thunderhead and it did not progress naturally. He went from being minorly likable to just being an obstacle, basically, of the main storyline between Citra and Rowan that I wanted. Also, his weird romance that was happening. Like, not the one he ended up with, but the Thunderhead story started having feelings for him and I was like what the frick? I'm usually all for some AI romance. Ask Aiden and that chick from Illuminae. But this felt weird because Thunderhead and Mr. Grayson really had a daddy-son relationship for a while. Strange book. Bad character handling. The Scythe trilogy itself to me was just not good character wise and then my rule is if you're not good with characters stop adding in more characters and that's what this book really did in its sequels. Grayson included. I apologize for the lawnmower sounds. The garage is literally right there behind me. Okay, the fourth best character of 2020, who is male and who is a stud muffin, is my boy Rook from an Enchantment of Ravens. Why? Because he's cute and dreamy. Y you need more than that. Fine, I'll give you some literary analysis. He was also chivalrous. An Enchantment of Ravens was actually one of my favorite books this year. If I had like a top 10 list of the best books of 2020 instead of a top five, it would have definitely made it. And I read it pretty early this year, maybe around like February, and that book honestly has stuck with me for a long time. So I greatly encourage you to read it, it's super short. It's actually my favorite Fae book, cause it did its, I'm sorry, I've had hiccups all day. <laughs> Ugh. I was told whenever you have hiccups, think of a pineapple. See? <sighs> I forgot who I was talking about, now I'm just thinking about pineapples. Oh, Rook, you cute little stud muffin. Oh, he turns into a, a, a Rook and a horse sometimes. He's very handy. Okay, anyways, the world of an enchantment of ravens was so interesting because one of my least favorite things about Fey book is that it always had the cliche of the Fey, the fairies thinking themselves so much higher than the humans. But in Enchantment of Ravens had like the two different races working alongside each other. The humans were afraid of the Fey, but the Fey loved the humans because the Fey in this book could not make anything. Like they had immortality and magic, but the cost of that was they could not make anything. They could not write, they could not cook, they could not paint, so they depend on humans to provide that stuff for them. And it's not like the typical, oh, let's kidnap some girls in the middle of the night fey stuff. Like, they pay for their services, it's good for the towns. Like, it was a, uh, cinem cinematic, symbiotic relationship. And our boy Rook, he's like one of the high up autumn princes, I think? Court of Autumn, something like that. So he comes into town one day and he's like, I am here for a marvelous painter. I have heard tales of this lady. Oh, I hope her name is Isabel. I think it's Isabel. He goes to our lady Isabel, who is literally the best painter. And he's like, will you paint my portrait for me, darling? I paint your portrait any day, sir. Mm -hmm, mm. And so they do, and it's really cute. But then, oh, Isabel, she's so good at painting. She manages to capture a hint of mortal sadness in his eyes. And so he takes it to his fairyland, reveals the painting to his court without checking the painting first, because he is kind of an idiot and really naive, but that just makes me want to cuddle him more, you little teddy bear guy. And so now the court's like, ha ha, you have mortal weakness. We're not gonna follow you. So then now Rook is mad, so he's like walking back to the human city. And he's like, Isabel! What have you done to me? So now he's like dragging her off to the court. And Isabel's like, I will not go with you, sir. One of my favorite things about the Fae in this book is that they're bound by like rules of courtesy. Like if you bow to them or curtsy, they have to bow back, like it's instinctive. So Isabel's being dragged away by Rook and she manages to like bow. So he has to like bow back. He like takes a step, then she bows, then he has to bow back. And so like they're like barely moving, like bowing every other step at each other. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and just his personality was so cute. He did not know a lot about the human realm. He was fascinated by all of it. He loved my girl Isabel. And he was just a great pleasure to read. He was a gentleman and a scholar and I wish him well. I wish that book was so much longer because I loved it. He wasn't deep, he was cute. Okay, I don't have to explain myself further. And now we're at the middle of the journey. The third worst character of 2020, the middling worst of the dudes, is of course Kafka from the freaking shore. 
why for banging his mom. And now the third best character of 2020. Who is the dude? He was the last book, the last series I read in 2020. And that is the Drow Elf Dritz the Erden from the Legend of Dread series. This man, no, nay, this elf of outstanding moral fiber is a gentleman and a scholar, and he fight good. And he's got the sexy, long, white elf hair. That's automatically two stars for me right there. So I was really scared to get into this series because I knew nothing about Dungeons and Dragons. This is a Dungeons and Dragons based series. You do not need to know anything about Dungeons and Dragons. It tells you everything you need to know diving right into it so you may enjoy the Dreads without any prior knowledge to how to play these games. So the Drow Society is based on power. The nobles reside in houses. The top eight houses live on the council. They're the female matriarchs that make all the rules. The dudes are inferior to the ladies. And the only way to like elevate your house's status is to kill some of the houses above you in the totem pole. You have to get away with the murder of the entire house, all the children, all the residents, without any witnesses. Because if there's even one witness, they can go to the council and they can testify against you and they will summon down a rain of brimstone to annihilate your house instead. So Dritz is born in the middle of all of that. He's about to be sacrificed as this wee little infant that was literally just popped out in order to glorify Loth the Spider Queen. But the intervention of fate stays the blade holder's hand and our Dritz is allowed to grow up in the Duerden household. But there is something off-putting about this young elf. He, even though he is the greatest spider, just naturally and with the skills taught by the house's weapon master, Zack, he just does not have the murderous tenacity of his race. He cares. <laughs> he is not inherently evil, and he believes that not all the drill are inherently evil, but he's pretty much proven wrong a lot. So he forsakes his society and strikes out on his own. He was a really good noble character. This book kind of reads, uh, it was written in the 90s. At first I was kind of, oh, this is really a prophecy chosen one guy, isn't it? Like he's the best at everything without really trying. But then our boy Dritz is just like troubled by his own existence. Then it gets all dark and depressing. Then there's all the cool fight scenes. He gets a giant panther as a companion. He was actually kind of funny too. So I greatly enjoyed this as a fantasy series and I loved him as a character. When I finally one day play me some Dungeons and Dragons, I will make myself a Drow Elf. In honor to honor my boy, sexy white hair, yes. All this boy wanted was someone to accept him and to finally find a home. And I'm on the other side of the page being like, bro, Stop by my house. I have all these cool books you could read. One of my favorite parts of his was when in the third book, he has to like trick a dragon into letting his party through a cave. And so he goes up to the dragon. He's like, oh, hey, Mr. Dragon. I know what you're thinking. I'm here to steal your treasure, but not really. I'm actually a dragon too, but I was polymorphed by a wizard and I need your help to turn me back into a dragon. And the dragon, the real dragon is like, wait, you're a dragon too? And Dritz, the fake dragon, he's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a dragon, but I've been a drow for so long, I can feel my thoughts changing. And now the drow elves, they worship spiders. Like, they cannot kill them, they have to revere them. And so Mr. Dritz says to the dragon, I've had this odd urge to kiss spiders. And the dragon's like, ew, I'll help you right now, friend. I almost fell into my bookshelf. If you did that, you might be lost in a bookcase. <laughs> The second worst male protagonist of 2020 originates from the second worst book of 2020, and that is The Sheriff from The Devil Walks in Mattingly. The Sheriff was literally the worst protagonist I've ever read because he literally did nothing and whined and moped internally throughout the whole thing. This man had no drive. Like, he's supposed to be solving a murder in his town. There's like mass panic going on in his town too. And he's just like, meh, about the whole thing. Nothing motivates him. He was so boring to read from. This whole book was a mess in my opinion. There wasn't a single likable character in this series besides the ghost who like vowed vengeance on the parties that helped in his death. I like that ghost. And I'm like, yes, knock him off. Go get him. I'll help you. I'll get the shovel. I honestly cannot remember the sheriff's name. 
He does not deserve one. It's like in the inheritance cycle, where all the dragons did a magical spell to erase the evil dragon's names. That's what happened to this sheriff. He, yeah, I think this character had a traumatic, not really backstory that made him so lethargic lethargic as a person, but you want a tragic backstory? Talk to Kaladin Stormblessed. And that guy was full of fire still. This dude literally just sat on a rocking chair and threw axes at a tree all day. That's it. I mean, throwing axes is cool, but when that's all you do, bro, you just need to hand your story off to someone else. I gotta be entertained by something. Okay, the second best male protagonist of 2020. It's a tie. It is Dero and Servo from Red Rising. In this series, our boy Darrow, who is a lowly slave Red, he has to sneak into the gold society as a gold in order to like, you know, overthrow their government, stuff like that. And during the gold contest of champions to decide who will live in their society and who will die because they're weaklings, he meets with Servo. Servo, who is an actual gold, but he's like the lowest of the golds. Servo is slightly deranged. I like him. These two together, form such a good friendship, and I honestly like Servo a bit better than Darrow. I love Darrow too. These guys' friendship was just, it was so amazing. Ugh. Like, these two were willing to walk through an armada of soldiers to save the other guy's skin. Darrow was the strategist and the fire servo was mad. Like, this guy hid in dead horses in order to ambush people. All because Darrow said, hey dude, can you help me out? I need to ambush this other army. And Servo's like, you got it, bro. There was a time where Servo was just so, so sad. And Darrow's like, come here, bro. And he's like, you know, hugging him. And I'm metaphorically hugging him too. And then I'm hugging Darrow. And all uh, these boys, they good boys. Servo actually reminds me of a dog a lot. Like, that's how loyal he is. And that's what his, like, attitude is too. And if you read the book, you know that's a pretty good description of him. Darrow's like a tiger. And Servo's like this weird scraggly looking puppy with mange but with big teeth too. They were dynamic and I love their interactions. And I think it went out of order because I want to end on the first worst protagonist of 2020. Mm, that guy's not really a protagonist, he's a character, but I'm gonna go right now to the first best duo, male of 2020. We have, of course, the Spitfire, the Broody, the spear-wielding Kaladin Stormbless, followed up by another dude, the axe-slashing, wit-mastering king of the doggos. It is Fitz Chivalry of the Assassin's Apprentice series. These two, I would die for them. Kaladin is honestly such a beautifully written character. He's realistic. Like, the boy has his mental breakdowns when he's supposed to have a mental breakdown. He gets up when he's supposed to get up. He makes a fool out of himself all the time. He makes the mistakes, but he always gets back up. The universe is literally out to kick Kaladin in the kidneys. And so the same thing goes to Mr. Fitz. The world hates these two. Their authors have a personal vendetta against them. Fitz is the illegitimate son of a prince and everyone hates him. And he has like this cursed beast magic where if he revealed that he had it, he'd be executed. Kaladin has the same kind of powers. He'll be executed too. Not like beast magic, but if they knew Kaladin had that, they'd probably kill him too. No one likes these boys, but I love them. They just read so achingly human. Like when they were both crying, and just kicked on the ground. I felt the same way. Honestly, Fitz probably got some more emotional reactions out of me because that boy was outcasted hard, especially in the first book when he was just a kid. They were both extremely capable fighters. And that's a big thing with me. I love fight scenes. And while I liked Fitz more on an emotional level, Kaladin was always entertaining. He had like the best boss fights ever. And he was the snarky type of funny. Fitz was the stoic, just observer. And he had a big doggy, a big doggy. Kaladin hates horses. And honestly, the last book in their series, and when I say last book for Kaladin, the Stormlight Archive, I mean Oathbringer, the last book I read in that series. Both of these last books, I had trouble reading through Oathbringer because it was really, really slow in some places and some chapters did not need to exist. The last book in the Farseer trilogy was just all over the place. Went from a killing quest to like a quest quest, which I did not like. But I stuck with these books simply because of the characters. And I do love their series and I want to reread them because I love my boys. My boys. You stay away. Okay, now we're gonna finish this up with the worst male character of 2020. Also, 
from the Stormlight Archive. We have a king, and his name is Elhokar, a character specifically designed for you to want to give him a wedgie. He's the type of dude bullies would see walking down the hallway and would instinctively want to put their head in a toilet. He is so whiny and petulant and just squirrely. Did I say whiny? He also tried to kill my boy Kaladin a few times, which puts you on my naughty list. But yeah, he's like, I, yeah, he was designed specifically for you to not like him. He is so paranoid. He, his dad was killed in an assassination attempt, the previous king. So now Elokar, he's like, oh, someone's gonna kill me too. Quick, uh, someone, uh, guards, get your crossbows, stuff like that. You, just walk around me with a shield at all times. And all of Roshar, all of the kingdom is like, that's her king? Can we get someone else? They're like, hey, Dalinar, who is Elokar's uncle, you want to be king? And Dalinar's like, I might have to. This guy's a loser. <laughs> so all through Way of Kings, I was just like side-eyeing this guy like, huh. You just, someone needs to put a cork in your mouth or something. <laughs> well, then the end of Way of Kings, where, you know, the person picks up the other person and just starts swinging him around. That was the best scene I've ever read. It was so cathartic. Specifically designed for you to hate him and want to slap him around a few times. You have to, you love hating Elokar. You wanted the swinging to keep happening. I actually might go reread that later because that was the best scene in Way of Kings. And y'all, that is my list. I am looking forward to all the new parades of men coming to me in 2021 to quote the Jekyll and Hyde musical, Bring on the Men. Bring on! Bring them on! Stay ready, my friends. I work out.